Hi, dear people. Good to be with you this morning. Is that too loud or is that okay? It's okay? Okay. Yeah, we're doing good. Um, <clears throat> good to be with you this morning just to get into the scriptures and uh, behold the beauty of our God together in a book that is so much about him. And uh, as I mentioned uh, to you a couple classes ago, as we study the word of God, it's always good to be just have your senses thinking about learning things about the character of God first, because that's, he's setting himself on display. And then you see how he deals with nations and individuals, but there's always this idea through Scripture of the righteous and the wicked. And so we, we see the lives of the righteous set on display and how they respond to circumstances in life. And, and then we also see the lives of the wicked set on display and how God deals with them. So uh, today, no exception to that. Just be a, thinking about those kinds of things as we dive into Daniel chapter 4, this great chapter about Nebuchadnezzar. So <clears throat> make sure you have a handout. They're out in the front this time, you know, on a fan, with a fancy little thing saying Daniel in here. I mean, we're moving up, people. In. So grab a handout. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this beautiful, beautiful winter morning. Um, snow still around, and always when it snows, and it's so pretty and bright, and we're reminded that uh, our sins... Though they were scarlet, because of the blood of Christ now washed, and we're whiter than snow in your sight. We're in, by faith, by grace through faith, we're in the righteous one and acceptable to you. And our faith pleases you, laying hold of him in his death and his resurrection. And we just thank you for so great a salvation, a salvation that allows us to behold your beauty and majesty and glory in his face, the face of a human being, but not just any human being, the wonderful, beautiful, glorious son of David, who is also the great I am. Things too marvelous for us to understand, but today we just pray you'd show yourself to us, Lord God, and help us to bow before you and love you more deeply and fear you properly hope in you, trust in you, and obey you. So thank you for this time together. May you bless it to the glory of your great name, we pray. For Jesus' sake, amen. Okay. Now, Dan we finished Daniel chapter 3, right? <clears throat> One of the great chapters um, in the Bible on faith. Uh, we saw these three young Jewish men cling with humble, supernatural tenacity to their God and his promises, even with, when faced with certain death, for their faithfulness to him. God set his glory on display as he delivered them by his divine power in front of Nebuchadnezzar and his highest royal officials, humbling the king, causing him to admit, wasn't that great? causing him to admit that the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego could, deli could deliver them out of his hand. The God of Israel can be trusted implicitly, as these young men did, because he's the only true God. He's ruling. And now this chapter is one of the great chapters in the Bible, um, exposing the foolishness of human pride human pride and in the presence of this great God of heaven. It's a marvelous chapter that we're going to enjoy, part to this time and part next time. But the chapter begins and ends, begins and ends with King Nebuchadnezzar extolling the glory, the majesty, the sovereignty, 
and wonderful deeds of the Most High God, whose kingdom alone is an everlasting kingdom, and his do, his, whose dominion is from generation to generation, and that he is able to humble those who walk in pride. Wow. <laughs> wonderful. So in these first 18 verses, the king gets a dream, which is really a warning that only Daniel can interpret for him concerning his need to understand and to take heart, take to heart, the purpose for which the dream was given. And here it is. In order that the living may know that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind. Man. How many people really believe that today? <laughs> Not many. And bestows on it, bestows it on whom he wishes and sets over it the lowliest of men. God will ensure that this proud, arrogant king learns this truth as he humbles him through the dream's fulfillment. And, and the, we'll talk about that the fulfillment next time. This time it's about the dream and some things we can learn. We will see that the stating of this truth in his dream, hearing it, is not enough for the king's perspective to change. Only the literal divine fulfillment of the dream will break his pride and truly humble him before the most high sovereign God who rules over heaven and earth. God, it's really wonderful. It's gracious what God's doing, going to do here for this man in many ways. So we'll dive in there <clears throat> as we move through. First, this introduction to Nebuchadnezzar's testimony. This is a testimony of this man in this chapter. You know, we have testimonies, right, that we enjoy hearing this king gives us a testimony in this chapter. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, it's first person, a lot of it. To all the peoples, nations, and men of every language that live in all the earth, may your peace abound. It has seemed good to me to declare the signs and wonders which the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs, and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. Wow. King Nebuchadnezzar. As chapter... I'm sorry. It seems like a... It seems like... It seemed good to me. It seems like quite an understatement, considering what he witnessed, you know. Yeah. Uh, it seemed good to me that I better start. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is, am this is amazing what's happening here. We're going to talk about it. Um, so we, it begins, as it begins, we have King Nebuchadnezzar introducing the testimony he's about to give concerning how the Most High God has personally dealt with him in his kingship over Babylon. And this perspective, you know, the, these first three verses are the result of God's dealing with him in the events that he's going to describe in the rest of the chapter. It is, it's clear then that what God did had an effect on him. It impacted him by what he testifies to here at the beginning and at the end of the chapter, he sums up what he learned. So it's bookended you know, with his, uh, what he's saying. So what, what he says at the beginning then is after he has been humbled and learned what God has caused him to learn through the event. Now, historical context, uh, just a paragraph here um, for you to have. We don't know the precise time. It's interesting uh, as uh, things have been recorded concerning this event, um, one Greek translation, and I wasn't even aware there were, I guess there's different versions of the Septuagint that have been given to us, but one Greek translation adds an additional comment at the beginning of Daniel 4.4, 4, 
that this took place in the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, a date that would correspond, Tanner says, with the fall of Jerusalem in 586. He says this addition, though, it's a textual critical issue, uh, is undoubtedly not in the original. He says it's a fabrication and receives no support from either the Masoretic text, the Hebrew text, or the other primary Greek Septuagint translation. So why would they add that? You know, he says it makes sense that they're, 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 they're saying his madness, you know, is given to him as a judgment by God because he destroyed Jerusalem. That's kind of what the, the, the translators are bringing out. Uh, he says more likely is the suggestion that the events in chapter 4 took place in the later years of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. We know he reigned from 605 to 562, long reign. And uh, one commentator, Miller, reasons clues in the text point to the close of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. For example, his building operations seem to have been concluded. We'll see that in 430. There was peace throughout the empire. We're going to see that. Possible allusions to the king's illness by a couple other writers. Uh, one of the Babylonian priests suggests a time late in Nebuchadnezzar's life. So when then? He had seven years of this uh, humbling by God and putting that together with these other things, the dream must have taken place, they conclude, no later than the 34th year of his reign, because then he had seven reigns, years, and then he was recovered around 571 B.C. Okay? I, just, just a historical note. So it's not, it, it, he's been reigning for a while over Babylon. Now this is, um, this is important with what he says in these opening verses. And, and this was an observation by a Tanner. He says, quote, We stand amazed that such a king as he would ever reveal this to his subjects publicly. Why? <laughs> Why? Assyrian and Babylonian kings typically in their writings and recordings, exaggerated their greatness and personal achievements rather than calling attention to their defects and weaknesses. This is not normal for a king like this. So much of the story is told in the first person by Nebuchadnezzar. Would it not have been greatly embarrassing to the king to recount this to his subjects? The opening decree in verses 1 through 3 provides further insight. Um, at the end of verse 2, the king says, uh, the, the Hebrew or the Aramaic, this idea from the NET translation, I am delighted to tell you. No one's holding a gun to his head to give this testimony. In other words, he did not tell this story reluctantly. Did he? It was quite pleasing to him to do it. He actually wanted to do this. That shows a genuine change in this man. That's just unbelievable that a king that has this kind of power and authority would humble himself this way before his subjects. I think it testifies to the significant impact this experience had on the king, bringing about <clears throat> what appears to be true, genuine humility before God. And there are a number of commentators who see, uh, think, on, that because of what happens to him and his response, that there may have been a genuine conversion, a heart change within the king with respect to his understanding of who God is. We'll talk some more about that. Okay. I, I kind of, I don't ever want to read more into the text than is there, but I kind of lean that way when you see this kind of evidence going on in the text. Um, but I don't know if you can be dogmatic, but certainly a, a change in his perspective. 
Um, <clears throat> the greeting in, in verse 1 is typical of this kind of kingship. In, in Daniel 6.25, Darius says, Then Darius the king wrote to all his people's nations and men of every language who are living in all the land, may your peace abound. You know, this was, so the greeting is pretty standard for this kind of person, but not what he's saying, <laughs> not what he's doing. In verses 2 and 3 then, we're on page 3, Nebuchadnezzar speaks about the great and mighty signs and wonders which the Most High God has done for me. Okay. And uh, these signs and wonders, I, I think, not only refer to the specific events he's going to talk about in chapter 4, because God's dealing supernaturally with him, with his own supernatural power in what he does to the king uh, to humble him in accordance with his word given to him through the dream about the great tree, uh, his kingdom. But they, they no doubt include, I think, as he's reflecting on everything, uh, the display of God's power, remember, through Daniel when he declared his dream to him years ago and its interpretation after which he bowed before Daniel and exclaimed, Surely your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries since you have been able to reveal this mystery. I'm sure he's reflecting upon that display of supernatural power. And what about chapter 3? When the Most High God, he calls him that, delivered Daniel and his three friends out of his hands with a, a, a absolutely miraculous dis display of divine power after he had declared in his prideful arrogance, and what God is there who can deliver you out of my hand? Wow. So I think all that's on the table as this king is being dealt with and reflecting upon these great signs and wonders. The king also declares in verse 3b, concerning Daniel's most high God, which he repeats also in verse 34, we'll see, his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. He is proclaiming with conviction, that, uh, I think a conviction that only comes from being the direct object, the direct object of the living God's discipline, that the, that the Most High is in eternal control of his kingdom, a kingdom which includes King Nebuchadnezzar. See, King Nebuchadnezzar is under this rule. He's learning the lesson God wants him to understand. Earlier in Daniel 2.47, remember he said, Surely your God is God of gods, but get this, and Lord, ruler of kings. He's getting it. How could he not? Now he understands this truth from direct personal experience. Now, folks, I think there's an, imp I, let's just pause. There's an implication here, you see, because before this happens where God directly deals with him, he's, he observed what God did through Daniel. He observed the miraculous power God demonstrated when he saved the three young men, okay? You, you can be in and around and near God and his truth, and observe what he's doing in the lives of others. Can't you hear at this church? We hear beautiful testimonies. We, 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 we see things with our missionaries, wonderful things happening. You're, you're seeing it. You're observing it. You're around it. But if you don't have a direct interaction with this God yourself personally, Observing things, seeing things isn't going to change you, right? Observing and marveling at what God does in the lives of others will not change you, will it? Maybe you can think, well, I'm, it's good enough just to be around it. I'm in the right family. I'm in the right church. I'm, I'm just enjoying these wonderful things that are happening 
But the bottom line is your need is for a personal encounter with the living God to be changed. Is that right? It has to be personal. To be changed, <laughs> Jesus said you need to be born again. You need to be born again. You need to personally embrace Christ as your Savior by faith, right? It has to be personal. I just, I think that's on the table here, dear people. Personal. And uh, when that happens, you'll have a testimony. It seems, uh, it's pleasing to me to tell you what God has done for me. Right? You remember the demoniac <laughs> that Jesus healed? Legions of demons, Mark, Luke 8, 38 and 39. But the man from whom the demons had gone out was begging Jesus that he might accompany him. But he sent him away saying, return to your house and describe what great things God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done. Do you see what's going on with Nebuchadnezzar? I have to tell you what God has done for me. Wow. Is that true for you? You just can't contain speaking about the Savior that's done for you what only he can do for you in bringing you to himself and changing you and... You just have to talk about it, right? Well, I think that's what's going on. I think that's what's going on. But what's interesting is that this, isn't, this testimony isn't happening in a vacuum. Look at the next note. I hadn't thought about this before, but here's something, food for thought. Tanner makes this observation. In Psalm 145.13... David states, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. Does that sound familiar? It seems entirely possible then, given Daniel's rank and position in the king's court, that during this time of his reign and coming up on this humbling, Daniel may have shared truth about his God from the scriptures, such as the Psalms of David, with King Nebuchadnezzar. That's not, that's very, very possible. Daniel had access to those scriptures. We're going to see later the writings of Jeremiah, I'm sure the Psalms. So he's probably sharing with the king about this most high God that he's been exposed to. Wouldn't that explain the statement by the king which so accurately reflects Psalm 145, 13? That's wonderful, isn't it? We don't know for certain, but there's a connection here. Because Daniel's with this man year after year after year after year. And the king has great respect for him. His highest counselor. I think it's through the word of God that he came to this conclusion about who God is. Does that make sense? I have never thought about that. Almost a direct quote. So here's the dream. We're going to get to the dream now and the need for an interpreter. Um, this, is, this is really cool. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream, and it made me afraid. And these fantasies as I lay on my bed and the visions in my mind kept alarming me. Um, sounds kind of familiar. So I gave orders to bring in to my presence all the wise men of Babylon that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians, the conjurers, the Chald Chaldeans, and the diviners came in, and I related the dream to them. But they could not make its interpretation known to me. Unbelievable. But finally, Daniel came in before me, whose name is Belshazzar, according to the name of my God, and in whom is a spirit of the holy gods. 
And I related the dream to him, saying, O Belshazzar, chief of the magicians, since I know that a spirit of the holy gods is in you and no mystery baffles you, tell me the visions of my dream, which I have seen along with its interpretation. So in verse 4, Nebuchadnezzar sets the context for his encounter with God. What's going on? The good life. The king was enjoying a time of peace and prosperity. First person narrative again, first person, he's bringing us into it, that he was at ease in his house and flourishing in his palace. Here's a, this is, here's a historical note, top of page four. This, because he's further down in his years and his reign, this was probably a point in his career when he had succeeded in military conquest. Boy, that's how you bring a kingdom like this into being. His kingdom became stable. Material riches were flowing into his treasury. And he was enjoying the fruits of his many building projects for which he would become famous. Hanging Gardens of Babylon, you heard of that, right? Things like that. Unbelievable stuff. One of the wonders of the world. Ferguson, another commentator, reports an occasion of Nebuchadnezzar's boasting found in his building inscriptions that illustrates the sentiment found in verse 4. Here we go. The palace, the seat of my royal authority, a place of union of mighty peoples, abode of joy and happiness, the place where proud ones are compelled to submit. I rebuilt upon the bosom of the whole wide world my royal decisions, my imperial commands. I caused to go forth from it. Wow. And he adds, the king proudly asserted that he made his palace to be gazed at in astonishment by everyone. That's not going to happen if you come to my house, by the way. <laughs> it was bursting. This palace was bursting with splendor, luxuriance, dreadfulness, awe, gleaming majesty surrounded it. He boasted that he made Babylon into a fortress, strong like a mountain. He says, I made the dwelling place of my lordship glorious. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. In verse 5, though, God disrupts the king's good life. It's at the high point of his reign that God sends the king an alarming, fearful dream that upended his enjoyment of peace and prosperity and the comfortable feelings of security in his beautiful palace surrounded by Fortress Babylon. Now, here's an implication. <laughs> Praise God that he disrupts the good life. People are living as they press down the broad road that leads to destruction, especially in America, right? Not everybody has a good life. But, you know, the American dream. So first I would just say praise God that he disrupts the good life that the enemy uses to drag so many into hell, living for the things of this world, the, the joys, the things, TGIFs, things like that. If he didn't disrupt that, people would press on into eternal destruction. It's the broad road, people, isn't it? Especially in America, the good life. He also disrupts difficult lives too, doesn't he? Despair, discouragement, going down a path of, I'm going to take my own life, I can't handle it, I don't want. He disrupts that. He comes <laughs> in supernatural grace and disrupt, it disrupts your life if you're a Christian. 
right? He didn't let you keep pressing down your life. Somewhere along the road, if you're a Christian, he disrupted everything and brought the gospel of the glory of Jesus Christ and your need to be delivered from eternal destruction and sins against the holy God. He brought, he, he brought that to you. Right? He changes everything through the gospel of Jesus Christ. I hope that's true for you. I hope there's a point in your life you can look back. It may not be like Paul on the Damascus Road, that kind of conversion, but somewhere in your life, dear Christian, you have had a change that God alone could bring about and give you life and turn everything around, change everything for you. Because that's what God does in his grace for his people. I think this is an example of that for us, an implication. If you haven't had that, man, you need to flee into the arms of Christ. May today be the day of your life being disrupted <laughs> and the day of salvation. Okay, the king calls for the guys. He has this dream. Of course he's going to do that. I mean, it's like, you know, when you have a fearful dream and you're this king, you call for the guys who are experts. Bring in all the wise men of Babylon that they might make known to him the interpretation of the dream. And, and this is, I, I bet these guys were, think about these poor guys. Unlike the disturbing dream of chapter 2, here the king did not demand that his wise men tell him both the dream and its interpretation. No doubt, can you imagine, the relief of the wise men who recalled past visions of being torn limb from limb and having their houses become rubbish heaps. Can you imagine? Oh, he, he's telling us the dream. Oh, great. Thank you, Marduk. <laughs> What's interesting, though, this is really interesting, is that the king tells us after all of them came in, except we're going to see Daniel wasn't there at this point, to the presence of the king, to, 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 relating the dream to them, they could not come up with an explanation for him. They could not make its interpretation known to me, he says. This is a dramatic failure by them to do what they were experts in and had, remember we talked about it, they had volumes written down concerning occult practices, how you interpret past dreams that were written down for reference to see how things work and correspond in order to interpret a dream which they had been given by the king. What's wrong with these guys? Here's next point. One can only conclude that their inability to perform their duty was a result of God not permitting them to do so. Who knows what happened, but they couldn't do it. In order to once again exalt his name through his servant Daniel, and in 8 and 9, Daniel appears before the king, and we have the king states that finally, eventually, or at last, Daniel came in before him. This implies that Daniel was summoned with the rest of the wise men, but it got in God's providence, he was delayed until after it was clear that none of the other wise men, all the other wise men, could interpret the king's dream, they, that they could not do it. They, they, were, they all were there, but not Daniel. This delay only served, I think, in God's sovereignty to heighten the difference and ability between Daniel and all these other guys. God's setting Daniel on display, right, for his own glory. He's going to single him out. There's something different about Daniel. The king understands that. In Daniel, there's a spirit of the holy gods, spirit of the holy gods. Um, the king knew from the past, I think, that Daniel was amply qualified for the task of interpreting the dream. He probably didn't understand everything about how it was working, 
but he knew something was different. And he knew Daniel had divine help, right? Divine help. So, but I, I think certainly the king remembered what happened before, right? And Daniel, when he interprets the dream, uh, gives the dream and interprets it in chapter, uh, chapter 2, um, he qualifies his ability to do that with, with these words. As for the mystery about which the king has inquired, neither wise men, Daniel puts the focus not on himself but on God. That's what has to happen as God uses us to do wonderful things. As for the mystery about which the king has inquired, neither wise men, conjurers, magicians, nor diviners are able to declare to the king. However, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will take place in the latter days. And then he tells them what's going on. Isn't that great? I'm sure King Nebuchadnezzar remembers that. The king then testifies to his confidence that he can consider what he's going to tell him. He can look at the dream that he's going to relate to him and can give him the proper interpretation. So here he discloses the dream then to Daniel. This tree. Yeah, Randy. Yeah, I think he does include his, his Babylonian name because this testimony is going out to his citizens, and the citizens know this man as Belshazzar. Yeah. So you're right, but then it's more personal. But, yeah, but yeah. The yeah, because uh, yeah, that's probably how he talked to him in the throne room. He wants people to know who he is, but when he's interacting with them, he... Right, right. Yeah, amen. <laughs> Yeah, this he's he's thinking of he's relating it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he's obviously changed after it all is finished. After I think that's fair, but he's going back and giving it, reflecting on it. Amen. Now these were the visions in my mind as I lay on my bed. I was looking, and behold, there was a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew large and became strong, and its height reached to the sky. And it was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its foliage was beautiful and its fruit abundant. And in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it. And I put this in bold for what I'm gonna, a point I'm going to make. And the birds of the sky dwelt in its branches. All the living creatures fed themselves from it. He relates this dream. And this is a dream... Um, which describes the greatness of his kingdom, the description of the greatness of his kingdom. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about that, okay? The fact that it is described as being in the midst of the earth reflects, reflects its significance, the kingdom's significance and supreme importance with re regard to the rest of the earth and its kingdoms. Its height was great, and he expands on that. From, uh, in verse 11, we're told that it grew large and, and, and it reached to the sky, visible to the whole earth. It had vast, far-reaching influence, his kingdom. Uh, it he was not only blessed, remember, the blessings that are described, but it was a blessing to those under his authority. The shade is it provided probably looks at protection and security. It gave to those who submitted to its authority. The reference to wild animals may refer to lesser countries, territories that were brought under the dominion of the Babylonian kingdom. Um, it, he's, he's not sure how you would divide out birds and, 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 and animals, but it's just the same. It's the same idea of this comprehensive rule over those under him. It's meant to depict the general blessed status that his kingdom enjoyed prior to God's discipline against him. Now, here's a, here's a point. Um, God is using terminology that was common in, in, his, in, in this day to describe 
the greatness of these ancient Near Eastern kingdoms. Okay, uh, let's look at a couple texts. In Ezekiel 31, you have this uh, Assyrian kingdom. Assyria was a, uh, describing the, the, the kingdom of Assyria before it was brought down by God. Beautiful branches and forest shade, very high. Its top was among the clouds. Waters made it grow. All these things sends out its roots, channels to all the trees of the field. Therefore, its height was loftier than all the trees of the field. Boughs became many, branches long because of many waters, etc. Again, all the birds of the heavens nested in its branches. Under its branches, beasts of the field. You get the picture. Beautiful in its greatness. You get the picture. And then in Ezekiel 17, we have a description of the coming messianic kingdom as it's described, speaking of the restoration of the kingdom of Messiah after the fall of Zedekiah and Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord God, I will also take a sprig from the lofty top of the cedar and set it out. I will pluck from the topmost of its young twigs a tender one, and I will plant it on, the, on a high and lofty mountain. And it may even be a reference to Isaiah chapter 11 with regard to the Messiah sprouting. Uh, on the high mountains of Israel I will plant it, that it may bring forth boughs and bear fruit and become a stately cedar. And guess what? And birds of every kind will nest under it. They will nest in the shade of its branches. All the other trees of the field will know that I am the Lord. I will bring down the high tree, exalt the low tree, dry up the green tree, and make the tree, dry tree flourish. I am the Lord. I have spoken. I'm going to perform it. Every, all the trees are going to bow down to this tree. So this way of speaking about the greatness of these kingdoms including the future restoration of the kingdom of Israel under Messiah, is significant. So let me make a connection to show the significance, I think. Jesus makes use of this kind of imagery when he explains, and we don't have time to get into it, but the mystery of the messianic kingdom in the parable of the mustard seed, page 7. Okay? Parable of the mustard seed. Mysteries of the kingdom of heaven in chapter 13 of Matthew, things about the kingdom program of God that were not explained in the Old Testament that are now being revealed to his disciples. And here we have this parable. He presented another parable to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than all other seeds, but when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree. Guess what? So that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. A quote from the Old Testament, greatness of the Old Testament kingdoms. So I, here's the point. His kingdom, Jesus' point is that his kingdom will have a small beginning. See, that's the mystery. The mystery that wasn't revealed is a small beginning that will eventually result in the Old Testament promised kingdom consummation. That hasn't changed, but the way we get there is, has changed. His kingdom will have a small beginning during this inner advent age, but will grow as a multitude of kingdom citizens are added during the church age through the preaching of the gospel. But glorious kingdom consummation is coming at the second advent. Isn't that what the book of Daniel's all about? <laughs> the coming of this kingdom under Messiah? Power, glory, clouds of heaven. The glorious kingdom consummation is coming at the second advent. And by using the phrase about the birds of the air coming to nest in its branches, which is used in the Old Testament to describe the great kingdoms of the ancient Near East, he is saying that when he returns, to establish his messianic kingdom on earth. It will rival and eclipse the great kingdoms of the past in greatness, scope, and blessing. And you, you can remember what, remember chapter 2 and the rock that's coming? In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush 
and put an end to all these kingdoms that came before, including the kingdom of the Antichrist. But it will itself endure forever. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, the gold, the great God has made known to you, king, what will take place in the future. So the dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. So this little phrase that Jesus uses says, <laughs> we're starting here, but when it's consummated, it's going to be glorious, just like the Old Testament promised, and I'm going to reign and rule over the planet as the Son of Man coming in glory. Isn't that great? I love that. Just wanted you to have that little nugget for being here. Okay, God's coming judgment. We're going to have to kind of press on here. We'll make it, I think. This is where God turns everything around. And let's just, I was looking in the visions in my mind as I lay on my bed. He's continuing telling Daniel these things. And behold, an angelic watcher, a holy one, descended from heaven. He shouted out and spoke as follows. Chop down the tree, cut off its branches, strip off its foliage, scatter its fruit. Let the beast flee from under it and the birds from its branches. Yet leave the stump with its roots in the ground, but with a band of iron and bronze around it in the new grass of the field, and let him, notice that change, kingdom to person. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven, and let him share with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man. Let a beast's mind be given to him. And let seven periods of time pass over him. This sentence is by the decree of the angelic watchers, and the decision is a command of the holy ones. In order, purpose, that the living may know that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows on it whom he wishes and sets over it the lowliest of men. So, a declaration of judgment. Now, I've given you some information because I, I wasn't sure I had just had to dig a little bit for this for sure. Concerning the angelic watcher, okay, angelic watcher, a holy one from heaven, uh, descends to make the announcement. It's very simply put, uh, you have the information. This is just one of God's angels coming down to declare the judgment in the dream. Does that make sense? It's not some other mysterious person. It's it's one of the angels. Now, what's interesting, though, and you can read this on the next page, page 8, is that the, he says, um, he says a bit odder, kind of halfway down. So we, we, he confirms that the, these are angels. This is an angel coming from God. But this statement that the decree is by the decision of the watchers, and this verdict by command of the holy ones, he says, Tanner says, nowhere else in Scripture do we find a clear example of an angelic council that collaborates to make decisions of judgment upon mankind. We do, however, have an example of angels attending a heavenly court in which they participate and dialogue with God about divine decisions. This is seen in the prophecy of Micaiah against Ahab, the king of Israel. You can go read that. 1 Kings 22, 19 through 23. Yet here, the angels are not acting independently of the Lord. And the final decision in verse, noted in verse 23, the Lord has proclaimed disaster against you. So here's his conclusion. When you read something like this, it's a little bit confusing. He says, this strengthens the conclusion that in Daniel 4, 17, that the decision to bring judgment upon Nebuchadnezzar may have been made in a heavenly court attended by angels, but the final verdict was God's. Does that make sense? We don't know the mysteries of God dealing with the heavenly court and the angels that are there, but the bottom line is God's making the decision and they're communicating it, and in agreement with it, okay? You see that in Revelation, how God uses angels to make declarations of judgment, but everybody agrees it's his judgments are righteous and pure and good. Okay. In verse 14, the angel declares that what is coming on Nebuchadnezzar is a reversal of the positive statements mentioned in verses 10 through 12. It's just totally the opposite. 
But, verse 15a, there's hope because there, the, the stump is going to be left, and, and there's, there's hope in that. It's, it's, not a, it's not a permanent judgment. Does that make sense? There's going to be a recovery for the king. A ray of hope remained for Nebuchadnezzar and his kingdom. The bronze idea around the stump, he says, probably has to do with uh, some sort of protection on the kingdom while this judgment is taking place where it's not overrun by other countries and, you know, because, man, when something's happening to the king of one of these kingdoms, everybody else goes, now's the time to rebel. God didn't let that happen for King Nebuchadnezzar. And we, we mentioned this in, in 15b and 16, the, the judgment becomes personal. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Um, I don't understand what happened to this man. You know, it sounds like it's something coming out of a horror movie or something, but, but there have been things written about kinds of diseases, and who knows, it doesn't matter. This is what God did to him, to him personally, and I think the key um, is this idea of his mind and his heart. Uh, mind and heart is, is the, who you are inside. Um, it includes not only mental processes, but also the feelings, affections, emotions, along with the motivational factors leading to decisions, responses. And so uh, Arch, uh, Archer said, uh, the king's heart, including his Mental reasoning was the very source of his pride, and it's there that God touched him. Can you imagine how humiliating this would be for this man? <laughs> yeah, I think it's pointed out in your notes that it wasn't just grass. That term can include other kinds of things to eat that are not just grass, but that are included in what he was able to eat. But the bottom line is horrible. Most commentators see the seven periods of time as seven years. Verse 17b, let's look at this and we'll finish up. The purpose of the judgment we've stated, the first truth to be learned is that the most high God is the one who rules over the realm of mankind and de determines whom he will place in positions of rule and authority. We are not in control. He is. Man, isn't that something we need to keep being reminded of? When we look at this world, Revelation 1.5 says present tense reality about Jesus as he's described is that he is the ruler right now of the kings of the earth. But what's coming is that rule is going to be seen and God's name is going to be vindicated when the whole world sees him rule and exercise that sovereignty. But it, it, right now, it's true. That's chapter 1, verse 5. And uh, so, he's in control, not us. And this, I think, is really sweet, people. It says, God sets over it, the realm of mankind, the lowliest of men. The lowliest of men, the term, has to do not with unworthiness, but humility. Humility. The king, King Nebuchadnezzar, is going to learn humility. But throughout history in God's providence, not many powerful leaders, wouldn't you agree, have been truly humble? Isn't that true? When you look at the history of rulers and despots and, oh, horrible track record. But, but would you also agree, when a powerful leader, ruler, or king who has that kind of authority has this quality of humility, it is a great blessing to those over whom he rules. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? We're going to talk more about that, but man, if you have a boss, a humble boss, isn't that better than a boss that's just so proud and arrogant and I know everything and you do what I tell you, I don't care what. So, and here's the point, I think. God sets it all up for us to understand. Here's the point. And he, God, 
most high God, sets over it, the realm of mankind, the lowliest of men. And one day, people, the lowliest of men, the Lord Jesus Christ, will return in power and great glory to rule over the kingdom. That's where Daniel's going. Receive from the Father to the glory of the Father. Lowliest of men, wouldn't you agree? Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be held on to, privilege, but emptied himself taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man. Here we go. He humbled himself, the lowliest of men ever to walk the earth because of who he was and what he did. By becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now, here's the result. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue, every tribe, tongue, nation, will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Isn't that great? (laughs) Don't you want your leaders to have humility? And we're going to one day be under the king who is the humblest, person to walk the earth, but he's also the living God. Okay. Verse 18, Nebuchadnezzar just tells Daniel, declare declare to me the dream. You have the spirit of the holy gods. You can do it. He wants the interpretation. And so God has set the stage once more to exalt Daniel, and next week you better come back. We're going to see what happens to this guy and finish his testimony, okay? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you. Help us to see, as we read, to see who you are. And throughout this chapter, we're seeing truth about who you are in the beauty and majesty and glory of your person and, and, and we know that that majesty, glory, and beauty are seen perfectly and expressed through the Lord Jesus. Thank you for that. We're also seeing the difference between righteous and wicked men. Righteous men are like Daniel, humble, gracious. Wicked men are like King Nebuchadnezzar, with filled with self-centered arrogance and pride because of their authority. Oh, God, help us to know where we're at. May everyone in here reflect the humility of our Savior who did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself for us. Thank you for that reality, Lord. Thank you for this day. Bless our time together now as we worship. We give it to you for the glory of Christ unto your glory, dear Father. Amen. Amen. You're welcome.